Sure. Honorable Senators, I rise today to address the message from the other place on Bill C-83, an act to amend the Corrections and Conditional Release Act and another act. My contribution to this debate is not to urge you to vote in a specific manner, but rather to share my deliberations about this bill with you as you weigh your options. These are issues that I have struggled with in trying to determine how I would address this message. There are three areas that I would like to share. These are the impact of the bill on mental health outcomes for incarcerated persons, the need for cultural change in Correctional Service Canada, and the need for independent oversight of segregation orders. First, on mental health. It is my opinion that this version of Bill C-83 may have the impact of significantly improving mental health outcomes for incarcerated persons. Mental health assessments are vital to understanding the psychological harms that can occur in federal prisons and are essential for being able to identify the mental health care needs of those incarcerated. We know that about three quarters of federally incarcerated persons have a mental illness. This data underscores the importance for providing ongoing treatment and for ensuring that each person's rehabilitation plan is informed by their mental health care needs. Our chamber passed amendments on Bill C-83 that made mental health assessments mandatory for all federally imprisoned persons within 30 days of when they enter a federal institution and within the first 24 hours of an individual being transferred to a structured intervention unit. Furthermore, these assessments will now also need to be carried out by either a psychiatrist, psychologist, psychiatric nurse, or a physician who has had psychiatric training. This is to help ensure that these statements are consistent with expected professional standards. These amendments were accepted. None of these were in the original bill. High quality mental health assessments can help direct needed mental health care as well as re inform the rehabilitative plan for each federally incarcerated person. Given my experience in mental health care, I am of the opinion that this can be best achieved by ensuring that the person conducting the mental health assessment is a mental health professional who has the competencies needed to do the job and to do it well, and that every incarcerated person be afforded this opportunity. Members of this chamber know only too well what can happen if a proper mental health assessment is not provided. For example, in the fall of 2007, Ashley Smith died in a segregation cell after spending more than a year of continuous segregation in a federal prison. Ms. Smith was never provided with a comprehensive mental health assessment or treatment plan. Hindsight cannot tell us what the outcome would have been had she received the proper mental health assessment. However, due to this bill, in the future, every federally incarcerated person will receive a mental health assessment when entering a federal prison and within 24 hours of being placed in an SIU. This is a step forward. I do believe that one of our roles as senators is to protect, protect the human rights of all individuals in Canada. Being put in a federal prison is harsh punishment. However, we must ensure that human rights of those incarcerated be protected. We also must ensure that those who have a mental illness and are incarcerated do not suffer the indignity of having their rights to mental health care taken away because they have been incarcerated. In 1991, the UN General Assembly adopted the principles for the protection of persons with mental illness and the improvement of mental health care. That declaration said, quote, persons with a mental illness or who are being treated as such persons shall be treated with humanity and respect for the inherent dignity 
of the human person, end of quote. Our commitment to protecting people with a mental illness should not waver because they have been incarcerated. Indeed, in that harsh circumstance, they may need more support. Colleagues, we must continue to protect the most vulnerable members of our society by improving mental health interventions for federally incarcerated persons. Secondly, cultural change. A common theme that we heard from many witnesses during our study of this bill was the need for cultural change in the Correctional Service of Canada. The importance of this cannot be overstated. And I want to personally thank our colleague, Senator Kim Pate, for her indefatigable work at trying to make that happen. I've had experience in my professional life as a physician working to create cultural change in hospitals, <laughs> universities, and health systems in Canada and globally. This is not easy work. It takes immense effort, and is unfortunately, it takes a long time. It is very difficult to make the necessary changes and to make them in a meaningful and sustainable way. Yet it is work that must be done, and in some situations, legislation can be part of that work. It is my opinion that this bill can be an impetus to cultural change, but it cannot be a standalone, nor can it be in the vanguard of the change. It can direct change, but it cannot be the change agent. It will require close monitoring to ensure that what has been determined to happen actually does happen. In this respect, our chamber has already moved ahead. For example, the report on human rights of incarcerated persons will make a valuable contribution. There will be other work that we as senators can do, and we must do it. Lastly, the independent oversight of segregation orders. In my contemplation of how to respond to this message from the House, I have thought long and hard about the importance of independent oversight of segregation orders and the implications of judicial oversight as the best vehicle to provide this. However, I have been unable to find evidence on what form of independent oversight is better than any other form. I acknowledge that independence is essential in the oversight for segregation. This has been recognized in recent court decisions and Rule 45 of the Mandela Rule states, quote, solitary confinement shall be used only in exceptional cases as a last resort for as short a time as possible and subject to independent review, end of quote. The question I am struggling with is, should the independent review that is currently embedded in C83 be overturned in favor of judicial oversight? What is the evidence that we can turn to to help us with that decision? On this topic, we have heard many different opinions. We have heard from learned parliamentarians in both the House and in this chamber. I have spoken to numerous of our colleagues about this, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your advice. I have also spoken to legal experts outside of Parliament. The court decisions that I referred to above suggested independent oversight, but did not specifically identify judicial oversight as the preferred vehicle. And I must say that after all of this, I still do not have a clear answer. Thus, I am tempted to declare a state of equipoise regarding these two positions. I certainly share the opinion that has been put forward by all of those who have engaged with me on this issue that this bill is not going to solve all the challenges of segregation. That is a more complex issue that will require ongoing work. I also do not think that this bill is as strong as the version that our chamber sent to the other place. And I am disappointed that all the amendments that we made were not accepted. However, particularly with regard to the mental health components, I think it is a better bill now than when it first arrived here, in spite of the many reservations that I and others have about it. Honorable Senators, I personally have not had sober second thought on this bill. I have had sober 20-second thought. 
It has been vexatious, to say the least. I appreciate the passion, dedication, and detailed considerations of these important and complex topics that I have heard from all of you. I thank you tonight for listening to my thoughts, and I hope that as you decide on how you will vote on this message, that you will consider my deliberations as well. Thank you.